Hey. Welcome. Ty. How are you? How you doing, my friend? California greet you. Oh, look at this. Be a little Texas nice. hospitality. Beverly Hills in Texas, meet up. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Tillman was named by Forbes as the richest restaurateur in the world. But near and dear to my heart, you own a basketball team, which is probably the Probably the greatest accomplishment, in my mind, somebody could do for just a fun business goal. Um, owns 600 restaurants, 60,000 employees. Yeah, five casinos, but I have to say, I love them all. I love all the businesses and the hotels, but it's really great owning a basketball team. Basketball team, <laughs> that's, that's as good. And you've got a good team this year. So question from your book, um, Shut Up and Listen. Great title, by the way. Um, you talked about knowing your numbers, right? So we now live in a world, I'm in the middle of it, social media, everybody's become an entrepreneur, which in many ways is good. And people wanna think big, they believe in the secret and all these big picture things like I'm gonna succeed. But when I read your book, there's two things that stand out. Um, one is know your numbers, meaning you gotta have technical skill, you have to pay attention to the business. In your experience, you had a TV show, you've seen so many business owners. What percentage of business owners know their number? None. <laughs> no, really. A yeah. lot, all your successful ones. And, yeah. the, and the unsuccessful ones don't know their numbers. And I don't care how good your product is, if you don't know your numbers, and I can talk to somebody for a minute and a half and start quizzing you about your business, mm -hmm. and I can know real quick, you know, how much is your receivables, what's your payables, uh, uh, what is your cost of sales, what is your labor cost? And if they don't know those numbers, they're going to go out of business unless they just happen to have a product that is just flying off the right. shelf everywhere. Yeah. Because you have to know your numbers to be successful. What do you think? I mean, right now, it's all this in the news about big businesses, Uber, WeWork now is in the news. Do you think some of the issues they have is just not having enough common sense with the numbers? Like these companies are no, growing. No, I, I think that Wall Street finally said, you know what? Just because you're a technology company and all you have is revenue and you don't have any profits, okay, we're sick of it. We're sick of all the dreams yeah. and you're just going out and buying revenue but not worrying about a bottom line. Right. And for me, because I was public for 17 years, I took the company public when I owned 100% and I took it private owning 100%. But at some point, I think Wall Street just smartened up and said, yeah. wait, anybody can create revenue. I, I could start right now because I understand business and go grow a comp my company from four billion to 10 billion, you know, in 24 months. But, really? I, but I have to worry about the profits along the way. Right. Okay. Right. And so, so you're saying the artificial growth. It was can just artificial. Yeah. Absolutely. I can grow anything. But, but Wall Street was allowing these companies not to make money for years and years yeah. and years. And finally they said, wait, time out here. Yeah. We want to see some earnings. Yeah. Yeah, so do you think, the other thing that you, I was reading an article, it was not your book, but it was a recent interview where you were talking about, goes along with this, about every 10, it's been 10 years since the recession. Yeah. Do you think, one of my mentors told me, said, Ty, about every seven, 10 years, something comes along. Do you think we're potentially cruising for a bruising here? I, absolutely, and, and, and I've been saying this in, you know, all kind of interviews, you know, as I've been out talking about the book. And what happens is, and everybody wants to talk about the GNP and all the barometers of a recession, it's really simple, okay? We tend to overbuild everything in good times. And we've been on a building spree. Just look at LA, Houston, New York. We've built so many apartments, so many houses, so many cars, uh, so many restaurant seats, so much retail. And what happens is the consumer finally gets full and we right. can't eat anymore. And so what happens? You need a recession to let everything catch up again. And so there's supply and demand for everything from TVs to cars, to restaurants, to apartments, to homes. And right. that's where we are right now. The consumer is full. And yeah. that's why all of a sudden you saw the manufacturing numbers slow yeah. down today. And that's as easy as I can put it. We're yeah. full right now. We're all fat. But to someone listening, in my experience, there's opportunities in recessions. There's opportunities in expansion, contraction. Somebody listening doesn't necessarily have to be freaked out that there's no opportunity. There's still no. going to be opportunity, right? Let me tell you something. You can go back and look at my history, okay? And uh, Forbes has me right at $5 billion today. Mm -hmm. And I've made all the majority of my money in bad times. Right. Because that's when you can be opportunistic. This is how I live. 
you build your balance sheet and your liquidity in good times, okay. and then you don't acquire in good times. You acquire right. in bad times. And this is the time you eat the weak because yeah. the weak is going down right now. Every single business that I see right now is trading at a lesser multiple yep. and is starting to have weaker earnings than they had two and three years ago. Yeah. So this is the time, and I can promise you this, we'll come out of this recession and you can play this back in yep. two or three years if we go in it and then we're out of it. And I built my net worth considerably yeah. because I'm going to do some eating. I'm going to get fat in the next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, in a lot of ways, it's like contrarian. Get fat when everyone's getting skinny. 100%. Stay and, skinny and I, when everybody's and, getting fat. 100%. I have not done a lot of acquisitions in the last few years. Yeah. But just in the last couple of weeks, I've done two. Really? I bought Del Frisco's. Okay, I heard that. And I bought Restaurants Unlimited out of bankruptcy. Okay. And my team right now is in another city right now today looking at another company that's about to file that we're going to try to be the stalking horse for in a bankruptcy proceeding. I think I read about that. You, know, you put a stalking horse bid in. And or, for Restaurants yeah. Unlimited, but I'm trying to do it again because yeah. because if we're in the deal, people know that there's no financing issue and that we're going to close the deal. Yeah. If you do business with us, they will close. And because yeah. and, you have so many people kick tires and look at deals. But but this is the beginning of it right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm looking to eat some wheat right now. <laughs> Me and my business partner Alex are currently in the in doing the same thing. We've got a bid in at one one of the biggest US retail brands. All the retail's going. So one hundred percent we're in a bidding war right now. So one of the things that I like what you're saying. And as I read your story, it's a little bit contrary, which I like. I mean, I'm right to say you dropped out of college? Yeah. Dropped out of college, which is a little contrary. I mean, had a year to go, but I started making too much damn money. And you just say, <laughs> oh, I'll go back. I'll go back. And, and you know, of course, you never You do. didn't need to go no. back. And what's so funny is that uh, at the school that I was at that I dropped out of, I've been the longest running chairman of the Board of Regents at the University of Houston right now. Really? Since the founder back in the 30s. They probably so. forgot you uh, <laughs> You didn't graduate, right? No, I think they know it, but they know he's a pretty good good damn chairman. <laughs> and so you got, so you're contrarian around your education, your background, you're a contrarian how you think of recessions. You're also contrarian and most people go, can't make any, any money in restaurants. But I always tell people, anything humans consume at volume there's money to be made, 100%. whether it's steel or cars or restaurant. You just have to be re extra start smart on restaurant. That's why I'm happy to be talking to you because restaurant, I was in the nightclub business with a restaurant tour in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina when I was real young. And I saw it's a tough business. You have to be sharp. It is. And, and there's not, I, I'll just, I tell this to everybody. There's nothing more profitable than a profitable restaurant. And yeah. there's nothing more unprofitable than an unprofitable restaurant. Yeah. And it's just, do you hit that revenue number? And do you have the lease right? Do you have your expenses right? Do you, you talk about you that know, in the book, the lease. What, 100%. I mean, you, 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 people just make the same mistakes over and over again. And, and, and I learned to always learn from my mistakes. Yeah. And I'm a lot smarter today than I was 25, 30 years ago. That's, I, I, I did a tweet. I said, the main reason, the only reason to be happy about getting older is if you're getting smarter. That's the main advantage of age. I mean, you know, you know I, I'll, I'll say this is that. Let me grab a ball here. You can. We don't have to have a contest or anything. Bounce it around a little bit. Okay. Um, Sorry, you were saying. You can take the, the smartest guy there is or woman from your best university, Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, and I don't care how smart they are, yeah. okay? They don't have two things. They don't have experience and they don't have history. Yeah. And, and I'll outduel them every time on experience and history. And I don't care how smart kids think they are today. Yeah. They really are. And they're probably smarter than us at yeah. that stage. But they don't have history and yeah. they don't have experience. And that you can never make up for that. I don't care how yeah. smart you are. One of my mentors, Joel Salton, said you can't Google experience. You cannot Google experience. <laughs> you have that, to have it. That, that is a really smart <laughs> statement. He's and, a farmer and he has a lot of common. I always say common sense is no longer common. I tell people, you know, an entrepreneurial world, what happens, everything creates its opposite. As people get more book smart or more academic smart, it leaves a hole in the market for people with common sense. Absolutely. So owning a basketball team. Tell me about the feeling. Was this in the mind for a while? Like, oh, I'd let, cause you not, the, the neat thing that you did is not only did you buy a basketball team, but you got one in your home city. You know, it's really 
interesting is that of the 90-something professional sports teams in America of your major sports, there's probably only three, four people that actually own 100% of their team in their hometown. There yeah. might even be, not be that many, if you want to know the truth. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, because it's, now it's a lot bought in groups and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then not in your hometown. Right. And, and uh, you know, when everybody else was trying to figure out to make the numbers work, I went out and bought it. <laughs> yeah. And, and because you could never make the numbers work. Yep. Okay. It, but it's the greatest long-term asset also. Yeah. Because you've never sold a basketball team or football or baseball team for less than they were paid yeah. for the time before. But but uh, it, it's great. You know, I tried to buy the team 25 years earlier for $80 million, and I got beat out. $80 I don't, million. In 25 years. But you know how I look at things, and this is where you got to be positive, and that's what the whole book's about, is if I wouldn't have, if I would have bought the basketball team, maybe I'm only worth a couple of billion today right. because I would not have been growing my business. Right. So everything happens for a reason. Yeah. And so here it is, 25 years later, I'm worth $5 billion. I'm able to buy that team for $2 billion. Yeah. So things work out. You got to look at it that way. Do you way. think you maybe, you would have worked a little bit less hard if you owned the Rockets yeah. early? Well, maybe I would have just gotten consumed with the Rockets right. because because they'll consume you, yeah. okay? And, and I would have worked to build sponsors and do all this, but I don't think they would have been worth anymore. Yeah. But but I was able to build my company, and now I get to enjoy both. Yeah. I didn't have to sell my company to buy them. You have to so. be careful to balance. You've got all this other business, and the Rockets, it's just natural to want to just focus all day on yeah, that. Yeah, but, but this goes back to, once again, something I talk about. I know what I know, and I know what I don't know. Right. Okay, and so I really can't contribute at the Rockets office every right. day. Okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm not going to scout players. I'm not going to tell you who to pick. Oh, sh sure. Could I have a little effect talking about the business side and sponsors and expenses and all that? Sure, I might have a little bitty effect, but right. I still get up every day and go to my other office. And yeah. I never use my office at the Rockets because yeah. I just can't contribute enough to make a difference there. I looked in the Vegas odds. You guys are top four or five contender uh, Vegas-wise to win a championship. And absolutely, this year. and that's all you can do every year. Right. You know, let me give you an example. All you can do is put together a great team, and 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 hope to be one of the top four or five teams to have yeah. a chance at a championship. Because after that, it's luck. Right. Okay. Look at the great a injury. No, things absolutely. Like that. Look look at the great Golden State Warriors. Okay. The greatest team ever in the last yeah. five years. How many championships did they win in the last five years? The three, two or three. Yeah. three, and three. they lost two. Right. Okay. So no matter how good you are, yep. it still takes some luck. So my deal is with my team is we're going to set ourselves up to be one of the better teams every year. Yeah. And let's hope we get some luck. Yeah. And maybe I get some, and maybe I don't. Yeah. A few years ago, I would say the Rockets potentially were one injury, one, one Chris Paul. It. I mean that. That. It, let me ask you. How do you? This is a business question, but. How do you deal with that? Does that just, do, are you the kind of person that sees Chris Paul get injured and there was a great chance you guys would have won and gone all the way and won the championship. How do you deal with those kind of emotional setbacks? Are you the kind of like Warren Buffett says, think about it for three days, learn the lesson and then suppress it. Are you a suppressor or do they, does it pop back? Do you have regrets like that? I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, you know, okay. and I don't in business either because it's just, you'll drive yourself crazy. And yeah. I, thank God I get another chance the next year and the next year and the next year. Yeah. But I mean, have I thought about it and said, gosh, would that have been a story? First year owning the team, you win the oh, championship, man. but you know, you can't look back. I, I'm so thankful to own the team and have yeah. another shot year after year after year. Now, I'll be really disappointed if before I close my eyes one day that I don't win a championship. Yeah. <laughs> so, that, you know, and you never know. That could be the closest I get in the next 25, 30 years. I mean, you don't know. I mean, a James Harden only comes around right. so often. You only get a chance to have a James Harden and a Chris Paul on your team for so long. Yeah. You only have a chance to have a, a, a James Harden and a Russell Westbrook yeah. on your team for so long. So let's look, let's go forward five, six years from now yeah. if we don't win it. And I sit there and I say, this is James and Russell's chance. They're both 30 years old. Yep. They're both under contract with me for the next four years, okay? Yep. The Houston Rockets. So where are they gonna be four years from now? And where will I be four years from now that I will ever have an opportunity and they will ever have an opportunity? Because yeah. I've signed Chris for another, I mean, I've signed Clint for another uh, four years. I've got Eric Garden for yeah. another three years, four years. I've got PJ for a couple of more years. So 
You said this is the chance. Team, this, this is the chance yeah. right now. You need to come to a game with me. <laughs> I, be careful what you offer me. Yeah, absolutely. I may, you I, may show, I may show up. No, absolutely. This is something that you want to do. There's right. nothing like going to a game with the owner and enjoying yeah. it and before the game seeing everybody and sitting center court you need to try it I it ain't a bad that. deal <laughs> I, I will make a special trip i'm trying to think what uh what game would be a good one i don't want to take your best game because you got a better guess than me but we'll we'll, we'll have to figure that uh, out for sure and, and i'm just i'm not just saying it it's something okay. that you really should do it's a great experience i appreciate that um Changing topics completely. We were out the basketball court. He hit a full court shot. No one, we, it was off camera for a second. But uh, when it comes to just pure mindset, you talk about in the book something I think that's surprising that needs to be talked about more. You basically say, don't be afraid, but worry more. Because everything in the modern world, the zeitgeist is like, don't worry, everything just works out. But you're, there's quite a few business people, great business people, your you know, Forbes list that say it's the paranoid who survive. I, How do you balance that with having happiness but also worrying about I, I have no fear because I do my due diligence. Okay. Okay, so if I do a deal, I deserve to get kicked if it doesn't work because I did my due diligence. I don't do make-believe performers. I always do a worst-case performer for myself. And I know there's a paddle for your ass if you don't watch out. Yeah, okay. I like that saying, okay. so, paddle so, for your ass. So every day I get up, I have no fear of doing any deal, but I also worry about everything, and I worry about where can that paddle get me. Right. And so I better know my stuff every day. Right. So it's more of a matter of, it's almost like you're not an optimist, you're not a pessimist, you're a realist. No, I'm a re 100%. And I think, the, I, I told somebody about this, I think yesterday I'm driving in the car, I don't, and I said, I don't think because I own something it's worth more. Okay, mm -hmm. you know how everybody thinks, oh, well, my house is worth more, my boat's worth more, when they're trying to sell it. Right. I'm a realist, it's only worth this. Oh, I know, I, I sold uh, Concept last year. And he said, you know, you were right on, it's just, that's all it was worth, but nobody, everybody thought it was worth more, but that's truly all it was worth. Yeah. And, and I owned it and I sold it. But, but people have got to be a realist of what their talents are, what their abilities are, uh, and, and do your due diligence always. Yeah. Do you do think we live in a narcissistic culture that thinks more and more, and it's, we live in the selfie age, the Kardashian age, do you think people feel more entitled? There's definitely a, an entitlement that that is out there today, that was not out there before. Yeah, 100%. you think it makes people poor or richer in the long run to be entitled? I mean, there's a case for having confidence and self-esteem. Well, it's, but where it, does it cross the well, line? Well, it's just kind of, it's kind of like, well, I want to go to college, but I want you to pay for it. Right. Okay, and so I can tell you, uh, and a lot of millennials do support socialism. Right. But those same millennials that want to be entitled that, that want somebody to pay for their college, it's capitalism that makes billionaires and millionaires, right. not socialism. Right. Okay, remember, socialism, we want everybody equal. Well, I don't want to be equal with everybody else. I don't want to be right. equal with you. I don't want to be equal with them. I want to be able to separate myself from you. Right. Okay, in a nice way. Right. Not in a, not in a mean way, yeah. but, but when I can't separate myself, then what's great about that? Right. Okay. So we're going to make everybody win the same amount of basketball games. We're going to make everybody make the same amount of money. Yeah. Okay. That's the competitiveness that makes America great. And yeah. so we want to take the greatest thing we have is competitiveness and capitalism and take it away from our country. Yeah. I want everybody to have an opportunity. We'll see. 2020 is going to be an interesting <laughs> year here. It's going to be an interesting it's, year. But, but that's what made America great yeah. is that a guy like me can start out with one restaurant. Yeah. I, I, I don't think you were born no. successful. Okay. I'm, I was born to a single mom. My okay. dad was in prison when okay. I was born. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so do you want to move to a society that people like me and you and these people here can't succeed? No, because I think it actually hurts everybody it in does. the long run. It does. I love the competitiveness. Yeah. Great honor here to have Toman Fertitta here. We're talking about his book, Shut Up and Listen. I just read it this week. It's, it's a good book. What I like about the book is you say a lot of things that aren't generic cliches. A lot of business books now are generic cliches. If you don't know Toman, 
He was named by Forbes as the richest restaurateur in the world, $5 billion net worth, owns the Houston Rockets, owns Morton's, 600 restaurants, 6, uh, 60,000 employees, casinos, aquariums, even a boardwalk I saw. Was that, <laughs> yeah, was that uh, right? Yeah, in Houston, I had the number one tourist attraction, the Kima Boardwalk, over 3 million visitors a year. Huh. And uh, is anything in the entertainment field, you know, the five Golden Nugget casinos and, yeah. you know, even here we're shooting this in L.A. and it's everything from Mastro's to Martin's to Catch, Catch to, which is, to, to, yeah. To, to, yeah, it's, it's great to, in a city like L.A., have a couple of the busiest restaurants in Mastro's and Catch. And I used to have the rainforest out at Disney, but they're building a hotel where the rainforest was, but I still have the big, uh, uh, Bubba Gump out there on the Santa Monica Yeah, I was going to ask you, Pier, I, got, I have you know. to hear, Bubba Gump is like one of the greatest themed restaurants in America. Every time I see it, I'm like, I have to eat there. Whose idea was that? But, but believe it or not, a couple of people came and took a, a uh, idea from my Joe's Crab Shack. Okay. And then went to Paramount and said, hey, can we license Bubba Gump? Yeah. And it's just a Joe's Crab Shack that became a Bubba Gump and... Uh, so I bought it out because I didn't like that they took a lot of my ideas. And you know, Paramount's <laughs> got a big deal. And you know who's really got a good deal is uh, who's the director from uh, Bubba? Zemeckis. Yes, Zemeckis. And, Zemeckis. And, and, and who's the actor? What's his Hanks. name? Hanks. Hank. Yeah. They make a bunch of money off of Bubba Gump. You'd be so shocked. So every, every shrimp, they get a small royalty. You know, believe it or not, when they cut their deal for that show, they took a huge backside. Really? And... and, and, and they are making a ton of money off of Bubba Gump Shrimp Company, <laughs> a bunch of money. And you got to give them credit. They yeah. didn't take the money up front. They took it on the backside, and they're doing very well off of Bubba Gump. Let me ask you this, because I'm a very, very junior deal maker compared to you, right? Me and I my think business you're doing part. quite well. <laughs> but it, you've got the numbers to back it. Let me ask, what is, I, I often say, what do they not teach us in school? There's many things. And one of the simple things is sales, people skills, reading people. You mentioned due diligence, just deal making overall. Wealth comes from deal making, knowing how to spot an opportunity, value it, and then put the terms together. It, you talk about this some in the book. What makes you a good deal maker? Well, I think that this is the problem with college and is that they teach you the theoretical side of everything for the person that's working for you, mm -hmm. but it doesn't teach you to be the CEO, the practical side, and the young entrepreneur, whether you're trying to go up the corporate ladder or you are doing it, you're on. And it's just the simple things of, and these are some of my great Tillmanisms from the book and why Harper Collins came to me and asked me to write this book was, know your numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. You've got to know your numbers. There are no spare customers. We're all in a consumer business. People watching this, podcast for you or me serving casino customers, restaurant customers, hotel customers. There are no spare customers. We're all after the same consumer. To the 95-5 rule, that 95% of everything is right, so look for the 5% that's wrong. To the, uh, take the word no out of your damn vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Why does everybody say no in the hospitality business? It's, it's 11.02 uh, and I've called down to order breakfast because I was on a business call and they say, I'm sorry, sir, we don't serve breakfast anymore. That's fine, I don't want an Eggs Benedict, I don't want a Spanish omelet, I don't want a waffle. Just throw a couple of eggs and a skillet, scramble them and send them up with one of those pieces of bacon that you've got cooked for that club sandwich. No, sir, we don't serve breakfast anymore. Well, you're gonna throw a chicken, piece of chicken or a hamburger in that skillet for that chicken salad or that hamburger. Just throw me a couple of eggs that are sitting right there in that refrigerator. I'm yeah. sorry, sir, we don't serve breakfast anymore. Why do we feel like we have to say no? Yeah. Okay. So. I try to live by, because I know I'm after that customer, there are no spare customers, that consumer, we don't tell our customer no, mm -hmm. okay? And especially in LA, a lot of these super chef-driven restaurants, there's a restaurant in town that, that will only serve a steak medium rare. Hmm. And I'm not gonna say who it is, I'm not ever gonna go after a competitor, but you're gonna tell me how to order your steak? Yeah. And that's part of the society today is we're not worried about hospitality anymore or service anymore. A lot of the most expensive hotels now are the, these minimalistic hotels yeah. where they don't have any service, they don't have anything. Yeah. But I'm paying more for a room there than a five-star hotel. The most expensive hotels now are not your five-star hotels. Yeah. 
their minimalistic hotels that can't even get two star. Yeah. What happened to service and hospitality? Yeah. But you've proven because I, I was talking when we we're outside. It's like you pulled off restaurants because one of the the business adages you hear is there's no money in restaurants. And what you're saying is by having these things that you call, Til is it Tillmanism, right? They give you an edge. They and that edge, edge adds up to $5 billion. Right, and I'd go after the masses and not the classes. Yeah. And, and uh, so I really had you mean you, about, go, you like mass I, I appeal like, products. I want the masses. I'm going after the masses, okay? Because if, this is a telling that I tell my people all the time, and I don't even know that it's in this book. Now that I think about it, that's good. We've got it. exclusive we content got on the show. And honestly, that's every it, honestly, all the interviews I've done in the last couple of weeks, I haven't used one of the most famous Tillmanisms of them all, and that's you make it with the masses and you spend it with the classes. Okay. Okay. But even <laughs> Mastros and Catch is, as even though that they are expensive restaurants and they're a lot of fun and they're a great entertainment value, they're still for the masses. Yes. We do hundreds of covers a night in those restaurants. Yeah. Do you think now that with this approach, um, is it guiding you? You're going Golden Nugget Casinos. You just you're working on two acquisitions now. The the Rockets is obviously something, even there where it's for the masses. No, everybody's I, watching basketball. Believe me, and you know what? And it's no different than a hotel or a casino or a restaurant. You better put a damn good product out there yeah. on that court, or yep. you know what? You're going to look up there in those seats. And I'm not going to have any butts in them, no different than a casino or a hotel or a restaurant. So you've got to always work to keep a good product on the court. You've got to always do that to take care of your sponsors. And I go, I, you know, at the end of the year last year, I, the same thing I use in all my businesses, the 95-5 rule, 95% of everything is right. Look for the 5% that's wrong. And I sat there and sat down with the head coach and, and the basketball ops people. And I said, what can we do to make us better? Let's, hmm. we, we're 95% right, okay? We've yep. won more games in the last two years than in the history of the franchise. What's that 5% we need? And yep. we decided we needed a little more athleticism. Huh. Okay. okay, we need it a little. You we need got it to that move. in Russell Westbrook, You damn boy. right. Here's a guy <laughs> that the the greatest fast break yeah. transition player in the history of the game, a tremendous athlete to speed the game up yeah. for us a little bit in transition, and and uh, so I think that we got that five yeah. percent. So let's see if we can put that chemistry together together and go out on that court and get it done. So what do you say to somebody who's watching this? I have all different levels of entrepreneurs watching. What do you say to somebody who goes, that's great, that's his story, but he got lucky? Because there's a lot of people nowadays that say success is luck. What's your rebuttal to that or I, thoughts? You know, I have no problem in the world if we, I, I, I don't want to have to do it again, but I truly do believe this, that you always have a little luck, okay? Yeah. Absolutely. But you also put yourself in the position to meet that luck, okay? Yeah. I got out there and met people that I know have given me advice or helped me along the way or who believed in me, but also did something to put myself in that position. Yeah. And do, I'm, I'm very humble in the sense of I'm very thankful of everything. And I can tell you honestly, I've outworked everybody. My team has outworked everybody. And I do believe this, and I know this is a cliche, you can start all over again and the same people are going to end up with the money. Yeah. I hate to say that. But so you feel a, that way. I, I yeah. really do feel that way. Yeah. But, but now, do I feel that, oh, somebody was a tech entrepreneur and was working on an app and, and, and some other bigger tech company came along and bought it and they made $50 million? I do think that's luck, but mm -hmm. once again, they set themselves up for that luck, even yeah. though they didn't have a good product, right. because they developed it, and oh. they found somebody that was a greater fool to buy it from. Yeah. Okay, so they, they were lucky, but they weren't lucky, because they put themselves in a position still, right? Yeah. My grandpa used to say, once is luck, twice is skill. You've done it 600 times. You started with one restaurant, you've got 600 restaurants. Probably a good chance that it's not luck. No, it, and once is luck, twice is skill, no, 600 and, and, times is mastery. And I evaluate guys a lot, and I know some smart people, and I won't go by names, but they're one-hit wonders. Right. And I've watched them hit it big, and then their next 10 things, 
they were not successful in. Mm -hmm. So they really just kind of maybe got a little lucky in that one hit. But, but I try to think, and I'm not saying there's not a paddle for my ass, but I've been successful in restaurants, casinos. Uh, I've made a billion dollars in equity in the restaurant business, and I've done it in the gaming business. Mm -hmm. It basically started with one both times. Yeah. I want to make a billion in the, in the Houston Rockets, but I'm going to have to hold on to it for a few years. Yeah. But I think in time, yeah. the Rockets, I'll have an equi a billion in equity in that. The Ro I paid 2.2. I think you're going to look up in 10 or 15 years, yeah. and the Rockets will be worth 3.2. So then yeah. I would have made a billion dollars in three different industries. Yeah. And uh, so, so, so then you're not a one-hit wonder anymore. Yeah, well, and two so, industries so, is hard. Three is... But, you got the trifecta. Well, you got to, but you know, I've got to make it happen. I've got to keep building my EBITDA and keep finding sponsors and keep putting butts in those seats. And yeah. hopefully I'll do it in another industry. You know, that's what would be the, the next one? Well, I, I haven't built a hotel company that there's a true billion in equity in okay. either, but you never know. I mean, you just. What you do you think, think of the hotel business? Donald Trump, that's kind of the one thing he did that's still around. Are you a hotel fan, the industry in general? It's a tough industry because of the maintenance capex to keep them fresh and good. Right. But, but real estate, if you buy it cheap and you, 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 you sell it high, it's a good business. But yeah. it's a very cyclical business. Yeah. So you, you don't want to get in it at the top. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, all my hotels, you know, I may be only a few buying right and selling high or just keeping that in a good time or not far from being worth a billion dollars. Yeah. So, so that'd be hopefully your I'll get there. I hope. I hope. That's the sport of business. Yeah. The business is a sport and a competitiveness just like basketball, football, baseball, or anything. And it's the competitiveness. When I was 21 years old, I won my first Cadillac selling Shackley vitamins. I told oh, myself really? I wanted to own my <laughs> first jet at 35. and. And Did you pull it off? 100 percent. 100 percent. And then when I was in my 20s, you know, I said when that Forbes 400 came out, I said, I want to be on that list one day. Yeah. So you got to set yourself goals and try to set yourself apart. Yeah. And I talk about that in the book is that anybody can set themselves apart. You can be the best sound guy. You can be the best cameraman. You can do certain things and study your field. And then you get a break because you were such a good cameraman or you're the best sound guy that you got recommended to go on this set and then this set. And then all of a sudden in Hollywood, you're known as the best sound guy. Yeah. You can do things to separate yourself from everybody else by just working a little harder. I have a, I have a shirt that I wear. I put a quote on it. Be so good they can't ignore you. 100%. You know, people go, oh, that, I'm being ignored. Is, I'm like, nope, 100%. Long enough, Charlie Munger, who, who I like reading him, he says, uh, Warren Buffett's business partner, he said, the world's not yet um, a crazy enough place to reward a whole bunch of undeserving people. Meaning, in general, but not always, the people who deserve it. He said, the best way to get what you want is to deserve what you want. For you to get the jet, you had to deserve it. It just didn't come. It, it didn't, but, 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 but I knew that I wanted it, and so I was going to work as hard. And I said, you know what, i got to go, even though I'm making a bunch of money, and my dad told me after five restaurants, and I had five successful restaurants, I was making a couple of million dollars. I'm in the late 80s, early 90s, and he's saying, why would you want any more? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're in your late 20s, and you're making a couple of million dollars a year? Well, I wanted that jet. Well, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna be able to pay for a jet that costs to operate a million dollars a year, wouldn't taking half of my income. So, I had to just keep going and keep going and and having some failures along the way, and because they're not all successful. Yeah. And uh, but you just keep punching. Which do you I talk use mini goals like that, like the jet? I need to make more so I can pay the fuel. Like, do you use little like Jordan? Michael Jordan would read the paper if he went to play the Knicks. He was hoping. John Stark said something like, I'm going to shut him down. He needed these micro goals, and then he played his best game ever. Well, Are I mean, you like that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, and I've gotten to know Michael as a fellow owner and a wonderful human being. And just it's what he's done with his brand and name. And, yeah. you know, all these other basketball players, uh, you know, after their career, some of them still stay in the limelight somewhat. But Nike shoes still outsell oh, yeah. anybody else's. And the great LeBron James is, is the greatest brand there is. It's amazing that the Michael Jordan still outsells. The, yeah. And he hadn't played basketball in, what, 20 years, yeah. 25 years. So it's, it, it's, 
it's just the competitiveness, the fight, the keep punching, don't give up. Yeah. And, and that's what I've always done. And even today, um, and honestly, when I've got the Rockets, I really thought I'd, that's it. I've kind of accomplished everything I want to accomplish. And, uh, but already there's something else you want to accomplish. <laughs> You're too, I and can I'm tell. doing steps to go to the next step. Yeah. But it's a sport. That's what I do. Yeah. I mean, uh, why would you always want a bigger boat? You want a bigger plane. You want another sports team. You know, you just keep punching. What do you say to people? Because I, nowadays I get people following me that are very kind of zen and, and, you know, like the absence of desire is the way to happiness. But you seem happy. Do you think that there's different approaches to happiness like do you feel your path even though you're saying like I'm, they call it I think a hedonic treadmill like you're kind of like okay I got the jet now I want the this and that do you think there's anything wrong with that or does that not, make you have not great at life? all absolutely there's nothing wrong with but also I have no problem with the person who uh, first off I respect everybody for the talent that God gave them and everybody has a different talent, okay? Huh. You guys do something I can't do, okay? I have the respect for the Hispanic guy that can take the engine apart of a car and put, him, put it back together and go in there. And I just sit there and look at, God, you are so smart. Uh, the guy that could just be painting this house and he's able to cut that perfect line up there between the two colors. I just look at that guy and I say, how in the world are you so talented? How did, how did you get that? You were just born with it. Yeah. And that guy's just as smart as me. I was just given a God-given gift of understand finances and economics and, and business, just knowing how to go out and sell myself to be able to borrow the money and do things. But yeah. I have just as much respect yeah. for everybody else, the poet, the author, the whatever. You know, God gave us a talent. Find out what he gave you and use that. And it's not about money, yeah. okay? An academia teaching, a great professor who loves to get up and teach is is a wonderful person yeah and you know what i know i have lots of toys but you give me a good color tv a good comfortable bed and a cool room i'm pretty happy <laughs> <laughs> i know if you're from houston okay. you're like i need a cool room right. That's and we all city. and you know what and we all love to go we all love to to go out and eat great food because we can but let's be honest okay yeah. my last birthday I sat at home and watched Netflix and ate me some Popeye's fried chicken and gained two and a half pounds, okay? <laughs> but what's better than some spicy Popeye's and some red beans and rice and a great roll, okay? But yet instead, we usually go out to a fancy restaurant. But when you really get back to what we really enjoy and need, it isn't yeah. a lot. Yeah. And that's really what we usually enjoy even more. Yeah, I agree. In my life, sometimes I think, it's like with big houses. I have a farm and I have a little log house, 2,000 square feet. Sometimes I go there and I'm just like, it's almost like your brain settles down, you know, from, so I totally can see where you need that balance. No, absolutely. You do. Let me ask you, you this question. Two questions that, that I try to ask anybody who's hyper successful like you. One, best day of your life or one of the greatest days of your life. What was it and how did you feel? And does that be the, you know, what comes to the mind is like one of the great days of your life? Well, you know, you're, the day your kids are born is always a great day, uh, for one. Another day is I remember, you know, taking my company public and all of a sudden you wake up and you only had 12 restaurants that were making, you know, $10 million, $8 million. I don't even think that. But, but because of the growth and what we do with companies, which we were talking about up there, you wake up and you have stock worth a hundred million dollars. Hmm. Um, that the day that I knew that I bought the Houston Rockets, that was a pretty darn happy day. You know, how do you I feel won. on those days? Do you go out and celebrate? Do you get quiet and just contemplate? Like, I, I've well, never been one to celebrate, you know, yeah. just like I'll open a big restaurant and I don't, well, I don't need a fancy opening. Who are we? We're doing that for people to give them a bunch of free food. And then yeah. why are we doing this? I, I, don't, I don't need a party to make myself feel better. You know, yeah. it's, it's almost better to have the people that you are around that helped you accomplish what you accomplished. Are you okay. an extrovert or introvert? I'm a huge extrovert in one way and then an introvert in another way. You know, I'm a great people person. I'll talk to anybody who comes up. I'll take a picture with anybody because it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Yeah. But at the same time, I have a really small, small inner group that I'll go out to dinner with. Yeah. A really small group. Do you find that as you've gotten more successful, wealthier, 
that you go back to those friends that you had before because you can trust them more? Or you, do you keep expanding your friends, your, your friends and You know, believe it or circle. not, I'm, I'm, this is kind of funny and crazy, but I'm not friends with anybody from the past. Really? And, huh. and, and it's, I don't know if it's, because every time I was around them, they wanted to sell me something, or can you buy this, or would you buy insurance from me, or I've got this product, and they just finally got intimidated by me and stayed away from me. Huh. But, but I met two people along the way, four people along the way, uh, that have just been great friends and uh, I say in business you got to make your friends your friends and you know some of my best friends are a guy out here in North Point uh, who is the number one M&A company for consumer businesses that I told him to jump off the cliff a few years ago and leave <laughs> an investment banking firm and he went out on his own he's worth a couple of hundred million the CEO of Jeffries Rich Handler uh, and uh, the astronauts, uh, Mark Kelly, the one married to Gabby Giffords, who's running for U.S. Senate, and his brother Scott Kelly, who spent a year in space. That's kind of my inner group that hmm. I and, and a, a guy that's out in the deal that, that is one of my executives. That's that's kind of my scr small group of people that I hang with and will go out of town with. And that, so you almost that, designed your I, social I, circle. I, I'd have my own little small little world, and. Uh, I just, it's just the way it is. Yeah. You know, it's just the way it is. I just don't hang with that many people. Not that I don't trust them. Right. But I, I, I just, you know, when you have the free time, these are the people that you want to go, you know. So that, so the best days of your life, the social circle, what about the worst day you can think of where you almost gave up, you thought about giving up, how'd you get there, how'd you feel? Well, I, I, I kept punching. I can remember in the late 80s when the world had fallen apart and, and uh, it was just tough and you know it was tough and you just keep punching and you realize you made it. Uh, you know you talk about luck and I talk about this in the book. Back in the 80s and everybody wonders how did these banks get so big today that mm -hmm. they have trillions in assets? It's because all the other banks failed and they were failing too but some had to survive and so the U.S. government would come in and say, we're going to peel off these bad assets, but we can't let this bank fail with all these deposits. Right. And, and you're just going to get bigger. Yeah. Well, in the 80s, when the world was falling apart and I was falling apart, I had banks at like eight or nine. I had loans at like eight or nine different banks. Huh. And I talk about this in the book, and I don't tell a lot of stories. Yeah. Because that's another book. This was just more the Tillmanisms and the little things I did but not stories and the art of the deal. Every single bank that I did business with failed before I did. Huh. Now think about that, okay? You have these bank loans, you get the little thing to make your payments every month or every quarter, and things are really getting tough and you're starting to fall behind. And the FDIC comes in every Tuesday into Texas and they start shutting down the banks. And in a matter of six months, every single bank that I did business with shut down. Huh. And you don't—you can call the government. You can call them. But where do you make your? Uh, nobody knows. The so, you don't have to, so you don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. So I get—I <laughs> get. This is the God's honest truth. I get a four-year reprieve. Wow. And in that time, you can't borrow a dollar. Buildings in Texas are are just shut down during the middle of construction, and I get a four-year reprieve. So in that time. Remember, I'm a developer, and I buy my partners yep. out of the restaurant business okay. in 86, and I start building restaurants. Okay, so over the next four years, I scrounged together. I used credit cards, everything, and I opened up a restaurant in Dallas and in San Antonio and Kima, Galveston, um, Lafayette, and, and I build these restaurants, and I'm all of a sudden up making a couple of million a year, and the FDIC calls me. Uh, I think it was the Resolution Trust was the was the what they set up the government. The government okay. sets up these things and, and, and they want and, you to pay yeah, back. And they call me and they say, well, Mr. Petito, you've come up. I wasn't big enough for him to come at me immediately. Remember okay. that. And, and, and they call me and say, we have these loans. We need a meeting. And over the next six months, I negotiated. Had, I had started making good money with these restaurants and I was able to pay back the same full $2 million. They waived all the interest. And you know wow. what the guy told me who had my account? You were the only person that has been able to pay back 100%. Huh. Isn't that an amazing story? Yeah. And you want to know the next side of the story? Okay. 
I didn't do this because I couldn't fill out the disclosures and, and say how well you're doing, but you can't lie because you have to tell them you're making a bunch of money today. I signed that settlement, wrote them out a check of $2 million, and I had already put a deposit down on my jet, my first jet, I was 35, and closed on my jet the next day. Wow. But I couldn't close the jet while I was still negotiating with them. So you did it right, right after? The next day, I was because I knew we were settling, <laughs> and so I timed them. You do one and then the other the next day. Yeah, the IRS, okay. that'd be the FDIC that was a guy. Break. Yeah. I outlasted the banks. How many people get to outlast oh, the banks? Not many. But the U.S. <laughs> government's about the only one that outlasts the bank. What was the first jet? A citation jet. And then okay. I went from a citation jet to another a bigger citation jet, an S-2, and then a citation 5, and then a Falcon. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, Boone Pickens, who just died, I bought one of his, I bought a Falcon from him. And then from a Falcon to a Challenger, mm -hmm. and now I have to fly around in two G5s. G5s. <laughs> you got two G5s. Yeah. Does yeah. one follow you with the assistance? No, no, <laughs> no. Believe, you know, just, you just need to. We're a one G5 family right now because one's broken and it is not easy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I like that. It's a tough life. I like, do you have, do, is I'm that, very thankful. I mean, I am, I'm being sarcastic, but, but I'm very thankful. I mean, uh, life is good. Life is good. And, and I'm very humble about it. And I thank the good Lord every day. So one of the things in the book that, um, we kind of touched on here, let me see if I can find it. I wanted to go back to, yes, I opened right to it. The 95, five rule. So there's two parts of it. I wanted to understand it. So my understand, correct me if I'm wrong. Most people are pretty good at things. It's this last 5% that you suck at. It's kind of like the weakest link in, the, in a chain. You're only as strong as the weakest link. And then on the next chapter you talk about, but focus on, you got to leverage your strengths. That's another one. So how do you balance focusing on your weakest part, but while also, so let's say for example, um, for me, I'll give you an example. I think, um, my weakest point in the past was I have so many kind of ideas in my mind that I forget to focus sometimes, right? So maybe that's my 5% I need to get better. But my strength is also that I'm broad. Right. I reach a lot of people. So what would be your advice to me? Like how do I balance my weakness but still focus on my strength? Well, you've, you've become successful because you do 95% of everything right. And everybody that is successful, every business out there, they're doing 95% right. But the ones that really make it, go figure out the details in the 5%. Mm -hmm. and, and I always know that I have to keep pushing and driving everybody to get that 5%. And, and, and let's just look at it in a simple way. You know, I can drive up to, uh, and I'm just going to use a restaurant or a retail store just as an example. I was talking to Walmart, uh, their Saturday morning meeting a couple of Saturdays ago. And I just, and, and somebody asked me about the 95 five rule. I said, let me just give you an example, okay? You're the general manager of a Walmart and you drive up to your store that morning and you look in the parking lot and you see is there bottles left out there or cigarette butts and you go up to the front door and you look, are all the lights on? Is the sign right? Is there dead weeds around the flower beds around the front door? Are all the baskets in there? Or you go to the front door and is there smudges on the, the, the glass and you, does it look real clean out there? They, or is there spilt drinks and everything? Well. I hadn't even walked in the store, and me personally, or that general manager, I can judge the general manager of that store. Hmm. I can tell you if that's a well-run store. And I can pull up to any of my restaurants or anybody's retail store and tell you before I ever walked in the door if that's a good operator or not. Yeah. Okay? And if they're not a good operator on the outside, why in the hell should I think they're going to be a good operator on the inside? Yeah. So just think about when you're driving around and you're looking at somebody's business. Yeah. And it'll tell you a lot about them. That's the 5% yeah. from just a visual standpoint. Yeah. But you know your 5%, maybe I'm not quite focused because I'm trying to go in too many directions. So it's just you working with yourself and saying, I have got to follow through on this or I'm not going to get it done. Yeah. And I can't lose because all of us guys that are successful, we have ADD. Right. Okay. That is why we're successful. You think you have ADD? <laughs> Do sure? I think yeah. it? I know it. Yeah. Now, when I was in school, I think my teachers thought I had other bigger problems because we yeah. didn't focus on it then. But I realized I have it because I think all my kids have it. 
Okay? Yep. It's just something that you'd be shocked at how many of us have. I think I heard your daughter laugh out there <laughs> when I said, do you have ADD? And, <laughs> and, and, but most successful people do for some reason. And because that's our brains, that they're working in a complicated way mm -hmm. and that we're trying to always go do something else. Yeah. So I have to stop myself and say, I can't go on to this next deal or this next project until I've followed through and made sure that I've done everything here to make sure I'm successful. So yeah. it's kind of pinching myself and saying, step back and catch yourself or you're going to have a bad deal here. Yeah. It's that discipline. Well, good. Where's the best place to get the book? Amazon? Oh, Amazon or Walmart online yeah. or Barnes and Noble, any of the bookstores, the Hudson's all over the airports. It's everywhere, but you just order it online a lot if you don't have to leave the house. Yeah, you do it whatever you want. I'll put a link, tylopez.com slash Tillman, and yeah, I'll, re Tillman I'll redirect it. Tillman.com that then I think shoots you to everywhere else, yeah. I believe. Yeah, go yeah. to tylopez.com slash T-I-L-M-A-N, and it'll redirect you to the right place to get the book, more information. I'm glad you're going kind of, I know you've been behind the scenes making money. You know, there's a lot of people, it, it speak less, do more. You've been doing that, and I'm glad know now that you're getting out and kind of sharing the message because... People near, need to hear this. Common sense is no longer It's all common, common sense and logic. Yeah, a lot of your book is. is just like, it's common sense. There's nothing that somebody's going to say, well, he's just much smarter than me. Because I'm not the smartest guy in the room. But there's little things but that I But you're the richest do. guy in the room. <laughs> so you win on in that most one. Rooms. Almost, almost almost rooms. Most rooms I am. Very, but but uh, it's okay. And I love to be in a room with somebody richer than me. Because I'm going to learn something, whether it's from somebody in this room or some other room. So... Next time I see you, we're going to be at a basketball game in Houston, Texas. I'm going to definitely <laughs> take you up on that. Let me ask you this bonus question. 30 seconds. If you had to, this is your last day on Earth, you're going to space with Elon Musk, and you <laughs> wanted to leave your family and humanity like two, three sentences, what do you say to him? The greatest thing, the greatest Tillmanisms in just a couple sentences. Always be happy with what you have because there's always somebody who has less. Yeah. Always be happy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Go check out the book, Shut Up and Listen. TyLopez.com slash Tillman will redirect you to his website and Amazon. Grab the book. It is a good book. I read it over breakfast. And a good thing is it gets right to the point. So those of you who have a hard time reading long, long books. It's an easy one. It's, it's an easy, easy read. It's, it's dense, so that's good. So thank you.